thank you very much for, for uh, listening to our media panel presentation. My name's Jim Wells. I'm from Cincinnati Children's Hospital, and I'll be both moderating and uh, presenting some of our ideas about how stem cell biology will provide critical in, uh, insight into human disease modeling and discovery of new drugs for, for human diseases. And we have a fantastic panel today. Uh, Hans Cleaver is from the Hubrecht Institute in Netherlands, uh, Sandra Engel from Biogen, and uh, Kristen Baldwin from the Scripps Research Institute. And you guys can uh, introduce yourself briefly and what you'll talk about uh, for each presentation. And uh, a reason we're here is because of the excitement around human stem cells and their potential uses in drug discovery and, and understanding human diseases. Uh, in the past, We've really relied on, on uh, systems that weren't really uh, getting us to where we needed to go. So, for example, cancer cell lines that grow in a dish, uh, animal models, and the very slow process of, of patient research. And while uh, these provided us some fundamental ideas about diseases and how they affect the, the, the body, they really weren't uh, where we needed to be for drug discovery. And I think part of the the reason for failure, 90% uh, failure rate as drugs move through clinical trials uh, at the cost of $2 billion per drug, part of the failure rate is, in fact, because of absence of good human models. And I think we're here today to talk about uh, human stem cell models in, in drug discovery and disease research and how they're allowing us to do uh, really incredible basic and, and uh, clinically inspired research to, to move towards clinic, starting with patient cells. So. A patient nowadays can walk into a hospital, and we can isolate stem cells from, a, from them, either their, their resident adult stem cells that live, for example, in the intestine, or we can induce stem cells from, from any cell type of the body uh, and make these induced pluripotent stem cells. But regardless, these stem cells are now being used e either directly or by turning these stem cells into what we like to call patient avatars that are called organoids. Uh, we can now use patient-specific materials to do uh, uh, disease modeling and drug discovery. So this can be anything from studying genetic diseases. We'll hear a little bit about today how genome editing of stem cells can correct debil debilitating diseases, uh, and uh, how these approaches can be used to even screen for drugs or test drugs that are experimental on patient-specific organoid avatars, as, as Dr. Cleavers will talk about. Uh, before they go back into the patient, so for drug discovery and screening. And in the long term, there's, of course, tremendous excitement about generating tissue replacements for uh, transplantation back into patients who have had degenerative diseases. Um, now, my lab uses uh, stem cells from patients in a, in a wide variety of ways. One way that we're very excited about is we actually, as I mentioned, generate these organoid avatars from, from patient stem cells. Uh, these are miniature versions of organs, and we can study in the laboratory disease processes as they unfold. We can identify new pathologies in, in the laboratory and then go back to the clinic and help redesign patient-specific therapy to alleviate these new pathologies that we discovered in the laboratory. Uh, another very exciting use of stem cell-derived uh, uh, tissues are to try to recapitulate human physiology by putting these tissue organoid avatars onto microfluidic devices. Probably some of you have heard of organs on a chip technology. Well, using organ on a chip technology, we're trying to uh, develop a diabetes uh, uh, organ chip technology that would have some of the main organs involved in both type 1 and in some uh, type 2 diabetes and study how these organs communicate with each other all on a fluidic device that's, that's built in the laboratory. So there's a lot of excitement there to uh, use these chip uh, organs on a chip technologies to study disease processes and to test new therapeutic drugs. Um, or to discover new drugs, I think stem cells are very exciting. Uh, you can generate banks of stem cells from a wide variety of different patients, uh, really exemplifying the, the awesome genetic diversity that we have on the planet. We can uh, recapitulate that genetic diversity in a Petri dish and use those uh, diverse uh, stem cells, people from low, moderate, or high-risk disease backgrounds to study genetic factors involved in disease, 
environmental factors. We can, we can induce diseases in these uh, platforms. Shown on the right here is a, is a liver bud organoid from my colleague Taka Takebi's lab that he induced to be a fatty liver organoid to, to study uh, uh, liver, di liver diseases and, and to establish a platform to screen drugs. And uh, so lastly, and I think farther in the future, but perhaps most exciting, is to engineer tissues from stem cells that can be used therapeutically. You can use in the laboratory very uh, clever ways to, to turn stem cells into early stage organ uh, types that you can assemble and transplant using animal models for, for preclinical studies of, of tissue replacement. So I think um, all of these different areas are, are, are very exciting both to study patient disease, to identify new drugs, to test those drugs on patient-derived stem cell organoid avatars before they go back into patients, and I'll, uh, to, to uh, correct genetic mutations in stem cells and ultimately for tissue replacement. So I'm going to turn it over now to Hans, who I believe is next up, and he's going to tell us about uh, some fantastic examples of, of how they're using human stem cells and organoids to, to model <coughs> cystic fibrosis and to uh, discover new drugs. Okay, thanks very much, Jim. Uh, yeah, my name is Hans Klevers. I'm a scientist from the Netherlands. My lab is in the Hubrecht Institute in Utrecht, in the center of Holland. Um, my lab has been involved in setting up protocols to uh, take stem cells directly, so the resident stem cells directly from different tissues of individuals, patients for instance, uh, culture them in a dish and then see if we can use them for general scientific experimental purposes, but also for uh, specific advice as to what would be a good therapy for the individual patient. And I'll give one example in just a few slides of what has uh, actually meanwhile become uh, regular healthcare uh, in the Netherlands. And it deals with a disease called yeah, so it's a disease called cystic fibrosis, uh, well known to many. It is the most common hereditary disease amongst Caucasians. And it's believed that the reason for that is that uh, carriers of this disease are resistant to um, cholera uh, infections. And cholera used to be endemic in, in Europe in the Middle Ages. Um, what it does, it, it's a bacterium in your gut. It secretes a toxin and that toxin opens a channel. And this leads to massive diarrhea. And if it goes untreated, you essentially dehydrate very rapidly. Can you use up to 15 or lose up to 15 or 20 liters of fluid every day and, and you'll rapidly die. Now, if you're a carrier, you don't have that channel. At least you have a, a lower copy numbers of that channel and you cannot produce the same amount of diarrhea. So you're much more likely to live upon uh, infection by the cholera bacterium. Um, I tell you this because uh, actually we use this insight in an assay to see if new drugs that have been developed in the US for this disease, fantastic drugs, uh, if they can be matched to individual patients. So um, this is the airway. Uh, so this is the insides of the lungs, the airways, which you see here are the ciliated cells. So there are, there are these brushes. And on top of that is a thin layer of mucus that keeps the, uh, the lungs moist on the inside. It actually captures pieces of dust and bacteria and moves it out of the airways into the oral cavity and then, and then it disappears. Now, CF patients have a very hard time to keep this, uh, this thin layer of liquid, uh, or the thin layer of mucus liquid, because they lack a channel, the cystic fibrosis channel. Um, and as a consequence, this becomes very, very sticky. It doesn't move up and out of your lungs. Bacteria that drop in this layer of mucus will proliferate. It will actually slowly destroy your lungs. And the same process not only happens in the lungs, but also happens in, uh, in, your, in your gut, uh, in your liver, etc., etc. Now, Vertex, and you saw that here, has developed a drug that's like a molecular patch that for a particular form of this, of this disease, and this is a complicated slide, but it just shows you that this is the, the, the piece of DNA, this is the gene. Uh, there is one very common mistake in this gene that carriers that, that uh, CF patients can have, delta 508. About half the patients have this particular problem, but the other half have a wide variety of different problems elsewhere on this small piece of DNA in their genome. Now, the drug that Vertex developed was particularly designed to help these patients. So what happens in this channel is a 3D molecule. It sits in the, outs in the membrane of the cell. Um, there's a problem somewhere in that molecule, for instance, at position 508. And then the Vertex drug will actually patch up this little problem. And then the channel goes out uh, and works. 
However, it will probably not work for any of these other patients. At least it's very unpredictable if this drug would work for any of these other patients. And uh, another view of this, these will be all the patients. Uh, in Holland, we have 1,500. The rest are probably about 30,000. Half of them have the mutation that can be helped by the Vertex drug, but the other half have a wide variety of other problems in that same gene. So it's the same clinical problem, but it's unclear if the drug will or will not work. The drug is very expensive. You have to give it for a long time to see if it works. And uh, people have been looking for ways of avoiding to having to do clinical studies, which are expensive, and particularly with low numbers of patients, very difficult, difficult to do, to find other approaches to match patients from this group to this drug. And this is a test that was set up in Utrecht uh, with our collaborators, uh, Cors van der Rent and Jeffrey Beekman. These are um, mini guts, as we call them. So they are um, they are grown, in this case, from the rectum of a small patient, painless biopsy for small kids. Uh, we grow them briefly, and I'll have to play the movie again because it stops. And you can see that when we... It doesn't play. You can click with the mouse. And yeah, it still doesn't play. Well, anyway, so what, 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 what should have been visible here is that these are uh, 20 or so um, many guts, but they also could be many lungs. We can do it with many different organs because they all have the channel. And we can open it uh, with cholera toxin. And like what would happen in a patient with cholera, when the channel opens, fluid is pumped in into the gut of this, into this luminous mini gut, and it swells, it takes about an hour. If you're a CF patient, you can already see that the, uh, the mini guts are collapsed. They almost have no space in the middle. And then when you now add cholera toxin, nothing happens because they, have, they don't have a functional channel. They cannot pump the liquid to the inside. That's why they survive cholera. There's also the reason that they have uh, CF, cystic fibrosis. Now, if we take the mini guts from this patient and we pre-expose them to a little bit of this drug, of the Acombi drug, for about an hour, and we then do the test, on this slide you should have seen that the swelling is now back. So it's a very simple assay, it takes about a week, costs two, three thousand uh, dollars, and we've actually by now done about uh, uh, half of the Dutch population, 700 of these patients are in the biobank, and uh, this was the first guy, Fabian, he was very sick, he actually appeared in the most popular uh, Dutch talk show. So his, his doctor, course, from the end, realized that his problem was not the Delta 5 rate problem, for which there was a drug, but it was not so far away in the molecule. So he asked us to make mini guts. We tested. Um, in the lab, he, he responded very well, so we could determine that in a matter of a week. He was then put on the drug, and he almost immediately recovered. Um, <clears throat> he has a very, very rare form of disease. He only shares his disease with his aunt. And there's nobody else in the world who has his version of this disease. Um, he then appeared on television, as you can see here. The Minister of Health picked it up, started talking to us, but also to the health insurance companies. And now um, the registration for Acambi, so the way insurance companies pay for drugs, says that any patient with a Delta 5 rate mutation gets reimbursed, but also any other patient with a positive organoid test gets reimbursed. And we have about 50 or 60 of these patients now identified. And it's now actually uh, rolled out for over four, the four largest European countries to do the same thing. I think that is where I'll give the laser on <laughs> to Sandra. <laughs> That's Christine's. There's mine. There you go. So I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Sandra Engel, and I lead the Stem Cell and Genomic Engineering Group at Biogen. Biogen aims to be the leader in neuroscience, so most of what I do focuses on stem cell-based models to enable drug discovery for neuroscience. So my perspective is a little bit different. As Jim alluded to, um, there has been lots in the press about the high cost of drug discovery and the fact that the new medicines that are coming to the market has stayed flat for a very long time, although that's kind of ticked up in the last few years. And really, um, it's not that that isn't true, which it is, but oftentimes it's seem somewhat implied that we aren't aware of that problem and aren't working desperately to try to solve that. And I will assure you that in my experience, for many, many years, we've been having discussions about how do we make drug discovery better. And those conversations have often really come down to four guiding principles that I think are still in effect today and which really lead our thinking about how we go about doing drug discovery. And the first one of those principles is 
as was mentioned, humanize drug discovery whenever possible. And that means use human clinical data and human preclinical data to drive decision making. And when we talk about human preclinical data, we're talking about those early in vitro assays and those early sort of in vivo to in vitro bridging assays, where as much as possible, we try to make those human. And in the past, that hasn't always been the case. The second principle that we rely on is using physiologically relevant assays. In the past, a lot of drug discovery was done with uh, immortalized cancerous cell lines. I will say, unless you're actually studying cancer, there is no target tissue in your body that is really a cancer. So if you're trying to study something like a neurological disorder, then you should probably study neurons. And in the past, that wasn't done. So what we're trying to do now is really make sure that if we're going to look at a pathology, we look at the target organ that it happens in, and we look at the target tissue. And we try to do our drug discovery in that target tissue cell type. And if we go back to the first principle, it would be great if they're human. When you don't understand biology terribly well, but you do understand what you'd like to modulate in the clinic, you have the opportunity to do phenotypic screening. And phenotypic screening allows you to go and look for therapeutic modalities that modify that phenotype, but you don't necessarily understand all of the underlying biology that got you to the phenotype. And I would say for disorders like CNS disorders, where I think we know a lot more than we used to, there's still a lot that we need to learn. And so this gives us an opportunity of finding new therapies for diseases that have unmet medical needs. But if you're gonna use a phenotypic screening strategy, you need to make sure that the cell type that you're doing that screening in actually is capable of exhibiting the phenotype that you'd like to modulate. That leads you back to doing physiologically relevant assays and whenever possible doing them in a human cell type. And then finally, many people have heard the term precision medicine. With the advent of low cost genome sequencing and these large consortia studies where they're sequencing large numbers of individuals and marrying that in genomic information with the clinical information to the patient, we now have a wealth of information. And we have information about you know, changes that may modify how a gene or a protein interacts with another gene or protein. And we're obligated to incorporate that into our thinking. Now, in my group, we work on human embryonic stem cells. And I will say, in a self-serving way, I would often say to people that human-induced pluripotent stem cells or stem cell biology is really going to address all of these concerns and allow us to do drug discovery in a much better way. I will say more recently, i become a convert. And it's not only human-induced pluripotent stem cells that are going to help us get there, but it's a lot of these new technologies, things like organoids and microphysiological systems that are really going to allow us to make that physiologically relevant assay that as best as possible mimics in a dish what we see in a patient, because our goal here is to really be able to predict what's going to happen in the clinic and not be surprised. And so this really leads us to this idea of chain of translatability. It was put out in a paper by Moffa and colleagues when they were talking about phenotypic screening, but it's really influenced how we think, because when we think about drug discovery now and helping the patient, we actually start with the patient. And we say, what is it in the clinic that we're going to measure in that patient and then how do we measure that same thing in an animal model? And then how do we measure that same thing in a dish? Because oftentimes drug discovery starts with in vitro models. We need to do things in a dish. We need to look at cells. We need to try to find that modality that's really going to help the patient. And it's best if we think about what can we measure here? Can we measure that same thing in an animal model? And can we measure that same thing in a dish? Because if we do and it all lines up, then the likelihood that you're going to be successful in the clinic is high, and you won't run into surprises when you actually get into people. So if you look at this in practical sense, in a disease called spinal muscular atrophy, in spinal muscular atrophy, there's a uh, mutation in the gene that normally produces the protein. On the upside, humans have a backup gene. The problem is that it standardly carries a mutation. And so, but it's still there, and it's kind of functional. And if we can make it more functional, then, then we may be able to help the patient. And in that situation, we said, what are the kinds of things that we can measure in the patient? We can actually measure the levels of that protein in the patient's CSF. We can also measure how well the patient can actually walk and move. We can measure the levels in a mouse model of that protein. And we can actually measure how mice walk and move when they carry, when we engineer them to carry that mutation. And so when we add therapeutic modalities to the mouse model, we can see if it corrects it. 
and we can use stem cells from the patients and ones we've engineered and ask questions, can we see the protein go up? And we can do it with a therapeutic modality that we're actually gonna give the patient. And when you do all of that, then you can get a drug successfully to the market that actually helps patients. And that's what our real goal is. So how does this all bring this back to the stuff that I do in my day-to-day -day work? So I lead a stem cell and genomic engineering group. The theory here is that we want to have the right cells, and that means we want to have cells that represent our patient populations. In this case, it's almost always induced pluripotent stem cells because we can take them directly from the patient. We can change them so that they proliferate for a long time, so we can work with the same material over and over again. We can differentiate them into the cell types that we care about. In the case of SMA, it's motor neurons, but with the help of developmental biologists, we've been able to generate a whole lot of really important cell types, cortical neurons for studying autism, skeletal muscle for neuromuscular disorders, kidney, heart, liver, you name it. We have the ability to generate a whole wealth of cell types that represent our patient populations. In a lot of instances, we are studying rare diseases. It's hard to get those patient populations to donate samples because there just aren't that many of them. So we have genomic editing, which we'll talk a little bit about more. Um, and genomic editing allows us to go in and make those mutations. And more importantly, it allows us to take those mutations and correct them because there's a lot of human variation. And in a scientific sense, it's very best if you're studying one variable at a time. And so if we can correct the mutation, now we have matched pairs, one with a mutation, one without. That allows us to see the biggest difference between those two samples. And then we like to incorporate automation because as much as we would like to say that drug discovery is an elegant, or elegant endeavor, oftentimes there is a level of brute forceness to it in which you need large numbers of cells in order to really be able to do something meaningful. And we just need to be able to produce those large numbers of cells. And then as I pointed out, more recently we have a huge wealth of technologies that are coming together with our ability to do stem cell biology to actually make things that better mimic what's going on. When we make embryon or when we make stem cell derived cell types, oftentimes they kind of get stuck in this sort of neonatal early uh, uh, sort of developmental program and aren't quite fully mature. And oftentimes the patients that we're trying to treat are obviously walking around and fully mature. So the question is how do we get there? And what we've learned over time is that co-culture, so cells growing together and next to each other help influence their ability to become mature. Things like fluid force and shear in your body, blood moves through your body, cells are exposed to some forces. Those mechanical forces are often important to replicate to get that maturity. Organize are a new way of allowing self-assembly that Hans talked about, which really allow a complexity that we couldn't get previously. And then 3D bioprinting, because we as bi drug discovery scientists like things to be neat and orderly so we can do them over and again in a reproducible way. So these kinds of technologies all coming together are really helping us advance drug discovery. I want to bring up this one point about fit for purpose physiology. You know, when we start with cells in a dish and we'd like to model the brain, it's not one size fits all. The drug discovery process is a long process. We go from everything that's very high throughput and not quite as physiologically relevant to things where we've incorporated all of those technologies that we've talked about, co-culture, fluid, shear forces, mechanical forces, but much lower throughput. And we need all of those in order really to do a successful drug discovery process. So just a few points. You know, we want to capture the right cell type, the right biology, and the right complexity. We really want to make a strong chain of translatability so that we are measuring not only we're measuring in the patient what we want to measure, or we're measuring in the dish what we want to measure in the patient, so that we know from start to finish how that drug will work in the patient. And then we really are looking for a wide variety of fit for purpose assays, some of which are higher throughput and a little less physiologically relevant, but those at the other end that are very specific and really help us enable us understand what's going to go on. So with that, I'd just like to thank everybody. I'll hand it off to Christine now. Hello, um, I'm Kristen Baldwin. I'm a professor of neuroscience at the Scripps Research Institute, and I run, I guess, sort of a medium-sized laboratory of students and postdocs. Um, we, we at Scripps uh, are a basic research institute, but we're also attached to a translational institute called Caliber. So when we find drug targets and leads, we can immediately funnel them into drug discovery. So um, the way I've been describing our research, which is stem cell research, and reprogramming research, which is the um, 
process of turning one cell into another cell type, which is how we make IPS or induced pluripotent stem cells, is that we serve as a bridge between human genetic and clinical studies uh, that tell us what a problem is to the process of drug discovery um, through identifying disease mechanisms and targets that can lead to new therapeutics, as the others have shown. Um, also, by learning the rules of making cell types, we can um, uh, make some insights into cell replacement therapy and potentially in vivo cell uh, rescues. And so I'm going to now tell you um, how I sort of changed from a neuroscientist into a cardiovascular biologist through human genetics. So human genome sequencing can tell you uh, what uh, causes this enormous diversity of human uh, behaviors and human differences in disease susceptibility. And there are people with rare mutations that directly cause their disease, but what we're finding from genome sequencing is something different. It's that you have genes that increase your risk for disease, but you might have them and not get it. And so that's a problem we've been very interested to solve because those genes are what you get if you get a 23andMe and it tells you you have an increased risk for something, now what do you do? Um, and it's a hard problem that stem cells are uniquely poised to solve. Uh, these dots, these are all your chromosomes, and these are different risk loci for different diseases. Different dots of the same color are how many times the same disease can be increased in risk all throughout your genome. So how can we solve this kind of problem? Um, what we can do is we can make the right cell type, as Sandra said, from the right person with the right group of risk genes and try to figure out how they act together. And we do that by taking those individuals, fibroblasts or blood, converting them with a few transcription factors into these induced pluripotent stem cells that I like to think of as genome repositories. They keep your whole genome, all the com complex things that are different between you and me, um, and we can study them uh, and, and change them one by one with genome editing. And to get the right answer, as Sandra said, we need to get the right cell type. So uh, in my lab, we sometimes make them into neurons and we sometimes make them into heart cells. Um, you can also sometimes skip this step and go directly from one cell type into another. And I'll tell you two slides about that at the end. Um, so here is a, uh, what's called a Manhattan plot of all the risk places in the genome for coronary artery disease, which is the largest killer worldwide. And when we were trying to think how we could use genome editing and stem cells to study human biology of disease, we said, well, where should we start? And so what we decided to do is start at the most expensive part of the human genome. That's a region called 9B21. So this is the most expensive apartment building in Manhattan. Um, no one knows who lives there because it's mostly who knows, um, but they're very wealthy. Um, and, uh, and, and this region was discovered about 10 years ago. It is found in uh, two thirds of um, people uh, of uh, non-Sub-Saharan African descent. It's highly prevalent. It costs us 30 to $50 billion a year in the US. It causes 10 to 15% of coronary artery disease. Uh, and it's a problem to study. It's only in humans. It's not in mice and not in our model systems. Uh, it has no coding genes, and it's very large. It's a big, huge uh, chunk uh, of, of genome with about 100 individual changes. So it's been very mysterious. So what we um, tried to do is figure out how it works. And a number of studies have shown that what it does is it acts in the wall of your blood cells, uh, but we don't know how. And we know that it doesn't have to do with what you think causes your coronary artery disease. It has nothing to do with cholesterol or lifestyle. And indeed, Otzi the Iceman was found to have both this risk locus and signs of coronary artery disease. And we assume he was not sitting on the couch eating potato chips. <laughs> so, um, so what can we do? So what we did is we took these high risk and low risk patients that were uh, genotyped at that disease locus, we then turned them into the right cell types of the vasculature, uh, a couple of candidate cell types, the muscle cells and the endothelial cells. And then we said, well, let's just ask what this does by getting rid of it. And so we blew up the building uh, using genome editing. It went away. And then we studied the cells. And using a number of assays and tests for what genes went on and what genes went off, we found that when you get rid of this bad risk version, you change 3,000 genes, and the cells change from a bad-looking phenotype, a bad-looking uh, sort of inflammatory cell, back to a nice contractile cell that looks like what you actually want in your blood vessel. And we were able to show that removing this actually changed not just these 3,000 genes, but 35 out of the other 90 uh, known risk loci were regulated 
by this. So we identified basically 35 new drug targets that are regulated by a master regulator switch that is a non-coding part of the genome. So we find this really exciting and the cells we produced are immediate screening tools to start to interact, uh, understand how these, these different genes interact and potentially pick out which ones can be the best uh, way to go forward into the clinic. So we're really excited about this because there was no other way to do this. Mouse studies could not tell you this. Um, and so uh, this is the logic of what we're trying to do now for the brain. And um, my lab got to be in a television show that was hosted by Stephen Hawking. And, and if you study Stephen Hawking's ALS uh, using his cortical neurons, you'll find, wow, they're really good. If you studied his incredible genius in his uh, motor neurons, you would find out there's something wrong, right? So uh, cell types matter for neurologic disease, and that's the case. And this genome sequencing explosion we're having is giving us lists and lists of genes that increase your risk for so many disorder, uh, depression, addiction, schizophrenia, autism, Alzheimer's, and they're telling us, um, okay, we need to understand where do these genes act and how do they act together? So the problem that we have tried to solve is how can we get cells in a dish that use the genes that cause the disease? And it's a long story, but what we did is took a reprogramming approach and we said, what if we take all the known things that reprogram, these things called transcription factors, throw them all in together and find out how many ways we can make these different kinds of neurons. So these are skin cells that are turning into cells that look like neurons because they have these long branches. And we showed that we could actually find 75 out of 600 of the ways we tested would make different kinds of neurons. And these neurons now have genes in them, some of which are highly enriched in autism risk, some of which are highly enriched in schizophrenia risk, some of which seem to be involved in other processes. So we're using this new coding uh, reprogramming method to produce the kinds of neurons either that gene uh, genetics people tell us are important or that pathologists tell us are important, such as uh, cholinergic neurons and the locus ceruleus that are the first hit often in Alzheimer's disease. So we've been able to take these kinds of technologies and our improved knowledge of how to make cells and how to genome edit them to branch out and start to collaborate with uh, people who are experts in the clinic and in the chemistry world who are interested in studying a wide variety of wide variety of diseases. So uh, I started with building the bridge, and this is a picture of the New York City Marathon. Uh, this is, we're still uh, in Staten Island right now, uh, so it is a marathon, but I think that the stem cell technology we have is getting us across the bridge, and we just need to keep running. And then I would thank my research group, uh, who are a spectrum of diversity. Thank you. Okay. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, Looks like that mic's on, and <clears throat> as you can hear from uh, our experts, uh, we've made tremendous progress in the last decade using human stem cells to model disease, discover drugs, and move towards clinic faster and hopefully more successfully than in the past. Um, at the moment, uh, I think we're, I thought that was a great analogy that, you know, we're sort of in the, the crunch getting across the bridge, but I think, uh, we're nearly across, and, and I think we are now have another 24 miles to go to, to really push stuff towards the clinic. Um, but I, I think we're, we're definitely picking up speed. So maybe we can, if there are any questions, uh, uh. That's actually great. That was wonderful presentations. Thank you, all, all of you, for that. Um, and, and what um, Dr. Wells had just said was kind of leads into my question, which was what what is that next step? So, so there's, there's some really promising things that you've all talked about. And so the what is that next step to pushing some of these technologies um, into the clinics so that we can, you know, have more than, say, one cystic fibrosis patient being treated or, or dozens of them into perhaps something that could be applied globally? Sandra, would you want to take a stab at that? Sure. Um, I think in biopharma, the general idea is really to make this part and parcel of the routine workflow. I'd still say that stem cell biology and certainly these more complex in vitro systems are applied in specialized instances. Um, what we're really looking forward to is making this a routine part and integral to every drug discovery program that goes forward. And I think multiple biopharmaceutical companies are doing that now. 
Um, but it takes a couple of things to do that. It takes academic researchers who are developing these new technologies and um, evolving them in a way that can be applied to a higher throughput manner. It takes uh, cell service providers and organizations that help support that and supply these standardized reagents and plates that are necessary to actually move this forward. And then a place that's often overlooked is that you actually need a trained workforce in order to make this really happen. And certainly academia has done a lot to train a really great workforce, um, but this is still a very specialized field and finding people who can come into an organization and really help move forward these types of higher end technologies is something that we still need to focus on going forward. So I wonder, Hans, if you could speak a little bit to, since you've actually translated uh, uh, drug discovery using stem cell-based models into, into clinical trials. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about the, the regulatory hurdles and, and the negotiations with, with uh, the, the, yeah. the, the Dutch government and drug companies, because this is all new to them as well. Yeah, so I, I could say something general first. We learned, well, first when stem cells were, were being discovered and were being turned in these little organs, these mini organs. Uh, I and probably many other people believe that this would be great for regenerative medicine. You would actually use those cells to treat diseases in a patient. Um, we then learned that there's a, that is a very, very long road because you need, uh, you're culturing stem cells. People are afraid they turn into cancer cells. How are you going to deliver them? Um, who are you going to treat, et cetera, et cetera? Who are going to be the donors? So we then realized that they are fantastic tools in the lab, of course, but to translate them, um, another application would be the one that I showed would be to use them for precision medicine with diagnostics. You could also probably use them for drug development as you have been, uh, been addressing. Um, we set up a foundation. It turned out that the ethics are extremely complicated and also there are differences between the EU and the US. So we, we, we started a nonprofit just to build biobanks and to spread the, the organoid, the mini organ technology. And this has worked very well in the end. Looking back, this was fantastic. If it had been a, a real company, the ethics were very complicated. Uh, patients would probably not, have, at least Dutch patients, would not donate their tissues to a for-profit organization where stockholders then would make money over their disease. So, so far, almost every patient uh, agrees that we can do this. The nonprofit has a, acts as a commercial entity. It, it is not, but it actually uh, so it has contracts with a large number of large, small and large pharma um, who are, as you say, they're trying out the technology. They want to learn. They don't. When we when we allow them, when we when we send them organoids, which we can uh, after we set up this informed consent, which took like three years to get it legally and ethically in order for the US and for Europe. Uh, we send them and then we realize the other end doesn't know what to do with them and they, and they just basically die. So we have we train. So people come to Utrecht. Um, the, 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 the challenge here was because there were no stockholders, no, there was no investment money. So we had to really make a profit from the start with this organization, but it now has really taken off. They have 40, 50 people. They can now train, they can maintain these large biobanks. And, and this has been, as of particularly for the CF, uh, where we where actually insurance companies in Holland paid us to do this, um, uh, has, been, has been the way to go. So to have sort of an intermediate, an interface between my lab, I mean, my people do like to do things once, and when they work, they want to do something else. They don't want to improve or standardize or something like that. Also, there's no business model for an academic lab to do that because I have to write papers, write grants, and it cannot take five years to improve something. So, so this non-profit uh, interface was fantastic. Also, insurance companies would probably not have spoken to a commercial entity about this, but they liked the, the non-profit situation. Um, and the same holds for the government. The, the, our minister was also very actively involved in this. It was also unique that there was this one drug for CF patients. There really is nothing that cures their disease. They get antibiotics, they get all sorts of other stuff, but it doesn't cure their disease. It just keeps them sort of alive longer. This was the first time there was a drug. It was very expensive, you might argue maybe too expensive. And it was very unpredictable who would benefit and would not benefit. And the groups of patients were simply too small to test. Um, so when we had this one essay, we could give it immediately to a patient because there was nothing else. You could do the same thing with cancer, where, um, where the, the prediction uh, is about uh, correct. So, so if you classify a patient uh, with cancer, by pathology, DNA, et cetera, so clinical stories, 40% of the patients will respond to the therapy that you will then give. 60% won't, but you 
it's not tested for that individual patient if it will or will not work. Now, organoids, when you can grow the tumors, you could actually expose the tumors to a series of drugs and then do the same thing as we do with a CF patient, pick the one that works and give it to that patient. Situation is very different because there are many, many good therapies for cancer patients already. We cannot tell the oncologist, no, we have, you know, you want to give drug A or combination A, we have a better plan, don't do what you want to do, but do what we advise you. That cannot be done because that goes against regulations in, in most, most Western countries. So there it becomes more complicated. We have to um, currently, and we and many other labs are doing this, following the treatment of patients. So organoids are made, patients go in a regular system, they are treated the way they should be treated according to protocols. Um, we can then see what our organoids had predicted. And uh, so we were actually uh, scooped, as we say in the academic world, by a beautiful paper in science last year, the first one, but there are now many coming up that show that the organoids are up to 80, 90% predictive, where the normal diagnostic procedures are only 40% predictive of success of your treatment. Now, I'm not sure if these numbers will hold up if it's no longer in trial settings, but this looks extremely promising. And this is for chemotherapy, targeted therapy, and for radiation. Now that's a great example where a success story of transitioning from the basic discovery to clinical application of stem cells. Kristen, I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit on that. It seems like Scripps has a really unique model to try to transition the, the basic discoveries in your lab into something that will be more uh, uh, clinically translatable. Can you expand on that a bit, on, on how that model works for, for you? Sure. I'm, I'm really excited about this because we were kind of doing this on our, our own in the lab, and then Pete Schultz took over the institute and took uh, Eric Topol's uh, Genomic Medicine Translational Science Institute that takes patients and sequences their genome and looks at their phenotype, funded by the NIH, all of us. Um, and Pete had a uh, not-for-profit drug discovery screening institute, and Scripps uh, has basic researchers and chemists. And so they brought this together under one umbrella so that we can be really integrated. So I can go, and the cardiovascular study was started with Eric Topol, who sequenced all of these patients. Uh, I said, I think I can find out what these things do. And now we have a list of genes and targets and cells, and we can go take them over. And I don't have to learn high throughput screening, and I don't have to learn these things. I can just go with a team that knows how to do that. So we have internal proposals. Uh, one that we're running is with um, Jeff Kelly, a, a chemist whose drug was just approved for a neurodegenerative disease, familial amyloid polyneuropathy. Um, and it works for 60% of patients, and they have a mutation. And he discovered this by looking at the chemistry and finding things that stabilize it. Uh, what about the other 40%? So now we have a collaboration to try to make the cells, just in this case, uh, from the patients that do and don't respond. And then we can screen for things that will help or that will augment the response. Um, so that's a very specific rare disease, but it is one of the first neurodegenerative diseases to have a chemical compound, uh, and this is a combination that stabilizes the protein that's making the mess and really helps the patient. So um, this is the kind of thing that I wouldn't have done as an individual basic researcher, but because I'm next to the chemist, the genomics person, and have the screening facility ready, um, we're really excited, and it's all non-for-profit. Um, so uh, it's, I, think, I think it's a really unique transition because academic <laughs> science for a long time had a wall between what you did with your molecular DNA biology in the bench and thinking about drugs. And, and that wall is being broken down in a lot of ways, uh, I think, across the country. Yeah, unfortunately, one way that the wall's not being broken down is is who's going to pay for this transition from basic to clinic. And uh, uh, while I'm not a Californian and I don't have a lab in California, one thing CIRM has been exceptional for is is funding transition from from the basic discovery into more clinical applications. But that's a very rare example of, of who's going to pay for this getting over the, the valley of death uh, between basic and, and turning something into a, a drug for a patient. And I think that's still going to be a major hurdle in moving forward. I mean, the CF Foundation was, I think, seminal in helping to move that forward, uh, as well as the, the, the individual group that you set up. But that's still going to be a challenge, moving uh, basic discovery into the clinic. 
I would like to say that CIRM has been absolutely essential to my progress, not only in funding basic research at the time where they, we wanted to get more people starting to do stem cell research, I didn't come from that background, but also one of the greatest things is the trainee program that has brought in master's degree students trained first by CIRM to work in the mm -hmm. lab for a year, uh, funded by CIRM. And they, uh, my trainees, I usually have one a year, sometimes two. They've gone out to work in all different uh, venues, a lot of times in pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies with the training they got in my lab of how to do the cell models. Um, or they're running core facilities at places like the Salk, um, allowing this technology to be um, used by a broader diversity of people. And I think that's been uh, a, a great thing. And I hope that other uh, non-for-profit institutes really will step into this uh, at the level of the trainee and the level of the funding in this this sort of hard to breach region. Yeah. It's really critical. Great. Did you have another question? I, I do. Actually, I have one point of clarification first. Um, Dr. Cleavers, you mentioned about the CF therapy. Just to clarify, is that is it a one once only treatment and it's a cure? Or is this um, uh, the drug that you're talking about? Is that something that is a kind of a lifetime kind of, uh, you know, a, re a recurring treatment? Yeah, so the drug is a chemical. Uh, it will not repair the DNA mistake. It'll actually correct the, the, the problem that's the result of that DNA mistake. You have to take it lifelong. Patients, uh, well, the drug has only been around for, for, for a couple of years now. Um, the patients that do respond uh, look like they, they, they become entirely normal. But the moment they would stop taking the drug, they would probably fall back in their disease, yeah. Okay, thank you. And then, so then I have a, another question, and I know this is a complicated one because there are, as you've already talked about, there are a lot of different factors in play in terms of, you know, overcoming the valley of death and who's going to pay and, and these sorts of things. But let's assume that everything is homogenous in the world and everybody is on board with, with the payment structure and, and getting things out there. How scalable is precision medicine? Like if, if we're looking at some of the work that's going on in the individual labs and the organoids that are being created, could that technology model be adapted and brought to, you know, different, different institutions, different hospitals around the globe? And is that an easy feat or is this something that is another, you know, are we looking at another hurdle that, that needs to be overcome? Shall I give this a try? Yeah. yeah so, um, Two or three technicians in this nonprofit in the hub in Utrecht uh, have actually, in a matter of two years, made biobanks of multiple hundreds of patients. And there's nothing optimized, there's nothing automated. The, the screens are now is a small robot. But if if engineers would develop machines that could actually do this at a very small scale, it would become much cheaper. It would become much faster. Uh, we now for for cystic fibrosis we need about one to two weeks to go from a sample to a to an advice to the doctor. Um, for cancer, sometimes can be much longer because some tumors grow very slowly. Um, if anything, you know, a miniature uh, test could be set up, for instance, uh, this would this would help enormously the throughput. Um, if we calculate, we could probably do all of the more complicated cancer uh, patients in Holland in one or two centers, but it would not be cheap yet. Uh, so it is doable. For drug development, which is a very different, different uh, activity, um, you need to to be able to screen large numbers of samples with large numbers of compounds to found initial possibly new dr drug leads. Um, typically, pharma companies can do screens on, on millions of compounds. Um, we are now up to 50 to 100,000. So it looks like, and this is all done by people who have no experience with this at all. Uh, we work with pharma companies in this, but it looks like that is also easily scalable. It'll be more expensive, but again, if it's done at a large scale, it'll become cheaper. Machines will be developed, it'll help. Yeah. Would either of you like to add to that? To the I think, you know, I think currently um, it is a cost challenge and a there is a scalability challenge to it. Um, I'm a big believer in technology. Where there's a will, there's a way. People will figure out how to bring it down. I think um, you can't deny the fact that it is a complicated payer situation in the United States particularly. And that does complicate moving things um, from sort of an early stage development into something that's much more routinely useful. I think, you know, 
proof of concept studies that prove that these are valuable additions to the healthcare system are important. Um, and they help uh, project a path forward um, that if the economics work out, if the advents or the advances to human health are worth it, um, you know, the economy will move that forward. I also think at some level, th this technology will reduce costs for drug discovery because you can, uh, as I was hinting in one of the slides, you can do population studies in a, in a dish, starting with stem cells from a wide variety of, of patients. And that's often why a lot of drugs fail as they go to fl tr uh, phase three, it's because they haven't really been tested on a wide variety of actual patients from different backgrounds. You can do that now. Uh, in, in a stem cell based assay. So I, I think at some level it, it may actually reduce cost of moving things forward. Any other questions? Okay, is any, uh, are there any issues that, you, that or you wanna, you wanna, I guess we're getting close to wrapping up. Any last minute uh, discussion point that anyone wants to raise? All right, well, thank you all very much. Um, I think this has been very informative and helpful and hopefully also generating enthusiasm in the community for, for the, the, as we're crossing the bridge and now heading on the long journey of drug, drug discovery, hopefully we'll be able to, to really uh, uh, try to break some records in, in uh, drug discovery. So thanks. <laughs>